Nice. Right. Um, can you see my slides? Yep. Fantastic. Can you hear me? I presume you can hear me okay because you heard the question. Thanks for the intro. Um, yes, it would be uh, it would be a shame not to be here, so I made the effort, even though I'm technically on holiday today. Um, this was uh, this is where I woke up this morning. Uh, there we go. Uh, so uh, so for those of you who don't know me, which I guess is is possible since I've been away for like a year and a half now. Uh, my name's Greg. I as as has been said, I used to be the community manager um, for for a while, uh, which was good fun. Uh, but I moved on uh, to do data things, and one of those data responsibilities I still have um, is to look after the survey, uh, which we do every year. Um, and last year we did the survey and then I published the results in May. This year we did the survey and you still don't have them. Um, and so I thought I'd quickly uh, mention why. Uh, here's a quote from Nate Silver. Uh, you might know him. He runs 538, a lot of political polls, a lot of sports polls as well. Um, very good statistician. Uh, and he has this excellent quote. Um, the data can't speak for itself. It, uh, we have to imbue the data with meaning. The problem here is that I can't imbue the data with meaning anymore. Right? I've been away from the community for quite a long time. I don't have the context. Um, I can't tell you what's going on. I don't have my finger on the pulse, right? So what I have done is I have been through the survey. I have looked at every question. I have generated like the sort of the, the intermediate graphs, the sort of summaries of each question, things like that. And I've put that in the hands of, of Melanie and Toma and Ori and, and not, not wanting to point fingers, but basically it's on them to actually write it up. <laughs> so, so those are the people you need to go and kick now. Um, but I'm sure, you know, it's, it's workload and we're all kind of like finding our feet in this current situation that we find ourselves in. So. Uh, so don't be hard on them. You can be hard on me if you want. I was a bit slow getting it done as well. Uh, but what I'm going to show you today is some of those results. I'm not going to go through all of it because um, there's like 55 questions in the Foreman Community Survey. And frankly, you just me just going through every single one of them going, look, it's the same as last year. It, it's not very exciting, right? So I'm going to pull out a few that I think are interesting. We're going to pick some themes. Um, themes are going to be about stability. It's going to be about maturity. Um, as we said, it's the 11th birthday. So you would expect to see evidence of maturity by now, right? And we do. So, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, there's going to be some notable exceptions. That's mainly because those exceptions are in Toma's talk, and I don't want to spoil it. Uh, so, uh, so you won't see me talking about things like configuration management, which obviously relates to his talk about Puppet. Um, but I'm going to cover um, just sort of generic sort of how the community views form and according to the survey, uh, and a couple of topics like provisioning and things like this. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, first, I'm going to start with rating. So how how does the, the community view form? And so we ask a set of questions every year. Those questions are firstly, how how do people overall, how satisfied are people with Foreman? And we've started specifically asking how people view the UI because we know that's something that can be, you know, it kind of needs to be opinionated. So we want to make sure we're getting that right. And then we have a, a set of a set of ratings where we ask about how support works across things like the forum, um, you know, things like reporting bugs, getting help, manuals, and also we ask about our releases, like the frequency, the quality, things like that. And this is the results. So on the left you see 2019, on the right you see 2020. And my takeaway here is um, 2020 is a bit more skewed. You can see it's a bit more, you know, there's a bit more of a diagonal slant in that. So you can see there's a bit more of a, a range of responses, whereas 2019 was very solid. However, when you put this through the statistical grinder, basically there's there's really not much change here. Um, most of this is noise. Um, Greg, individually, what uh, what what's that sorry? What what is good and what is bad? So and the, at the bottom is a key. So so one is is not good, uh, and five is I love it. Um, okay. And so so you can so yeah, it runs from left to right, from bad to good. So you can see very little bad, lots of good, uh, not so much very good. Um, but most responses are in the three, four, five, mostly in the four, and that's true on both sides of that, both 2019 and 2020. And for any given question, you can see it's kind of similar. Um, the one that's notable, I think, was how uh, the forum jumped from like here to here, because obviously I, I love that, because I, I was the one that implemented discourse for the community, so I love it to see that gaining popularity. Uh, but that's just you know, personal ego. Uh, so, um, so there's not much change here, right? And yeah, statistically, there's no significance to this. It's mostly just noise. Uh, so this is fine. What's important here is that it's okay for there to be no difference, because it's high quality. If it was low quality and there was no change, we'd be worried, right? But it's high quality and there's no change that, and it's difficult to improve when it's good. So, so that's fine. Uh, that's not an issue. Um, I'm going to move straight on to provisioning then, because the ratings are fine. Provisioning, I'm going to pick out because I think there's a couple of interesting results here. I'm going to start on the right. Uh, so, um, the, there were two questions about IPv6 on, on the survey. Um, and I actually think, I, I think I, either I dropped the ball or I didn't get asked, and I honestly don't remember which one it was. We probably shouldn't have asked two questions here, because one question was, do you use IPv6? And the second question was, are you going to use IPv6 in the next year? And I think from a point of view of the people um, getting to make decisions about who does what work, it's the union of those that's interesting, right? 
if you want to prioritize IPv6 coding in the next year, you want to know who's using it or who is planning to use it, right, as a, as a, as a combined thing. So I did that for you um, because as it stands, you know, you look at this and you think, well, there's not a great deal of people, right? But actually, if you do the union of those two things and say who, who has said yes to question one or said no to question one and yes to question two, uh, you get 36%. So one third of the community either already using IPv6 or planning to. And that's a sizable chunk, right? That's, that's actually quite a nice result. So I thought I'd call that one out just because it's not obvious in the in the raw results. I'm going to talk a bit about more general provisioning now, though. Um, so first, a more interesting thing um, is the is the big uptick in people actually doing provisioning with Foreman, and I think that's interesting because I wasn't expecting it. Um, I was expecting that to go down, or honestly, and and it goes up. And actually, the more I spent time looking through the results, and the more I started thinking about why that might be, it actually does make sense. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go through why as we go through this. So let me just hold that thought for a minute. And let's look at the next graph. So this is the types of provisioning people are doing. Um, the graph on the left I've included just because the data was right there, and I might as well, but it's the one on the right that I'm more interested in. And that's how people are doing their provisioning. Uh, and note there's still, even you know, 11 years after Form was conceived, one of its very first features, still most people doing their provisioning over BIOS Pixie. Um, even with the rise of UEFI and all of Lukash's fantastic work and the rest of the team on that, um, it's still mostly BIOS, it's still, and if you include the top two, it's still just mostly Pixie, right? Overwhelmingly mostly Pixie. And remember, this is a percentage of this graph. So that's an 81% saying they do do provisioning, of which 72% are doing BIOS-based provisioning. And that's 56% of the community. Over half, as a raw number, are doing BIOS-based provisioning, presumably of raw metal, since the only thing, other thing I can think of that uses BIOS is LibVirt. Um, and we know from other questions that LibVirt's not very high on the usage list. Um, so this gets more, the, 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 the plot thickens, right? Why, why is this? Why are we still, you know, this is the age of containers, is it not? Um, so what's going on here? Um, and I'm, again, hold that thought. We'll, get, we'll keep developing that, that, that idea. Other thing I want to note on this one is just how big this other um, bar is at the bottom here. This, this is a question where you have a huge long tail of people doing weird things with their provisioning, which I'm never going to support all of, right? Um, but it's, a good, it's good to know that, we're, that we do have this long tail and actually, um, Provisioning is weird and hard, and people have strange hardware, and some people want to do entire racks of Raspberry Pis or whatever, right? So um, it's an, it's just it's about the only question where you see other being a very significant proportion um, of the question. Because I mean, you just look over here, it's like nothing. Right? So um, just to clarify, other just means anything that didn't make the cut, right? I, I pick like the top five, top six, whatever. It's arbitrary, um, and then anything that's less frequent than that just gets bundled up into other. Um, so, okay, provisioning is still a big thing, um, and actually, in some sense, growing, quite interesting. Um, I'm going to come back to that. I want to hold that thought, and, and you'll see why, because the whole thing kind of bundles together. So just hold that thought about provisioning, and let's look at a couple other things. I threw this one in just for Thomas' sake, because he wanted me to. Um, this was a question that he wanted in there about what features can we get rid of. Um, and I think this is interesting mainly for looking at the gray bit. So, so where you have a three, um, so just to go through the key, since I got called out on that in the previous slide, thank you. Um, here, what we're saying is, uh, if you see red, it's people saying, I don't want this feature removed, I like it. If you see blue, it's like, okay, I'm fine with that, you can take it away. Um, and so, and, and it makes sense, right? Don't, nobody wants to lose the dashboard, everybody thinks Rackspace can go, uh, it's, and everything in between. What I find interesting from my perspective, um, and this is where I think, Plots like this are so much better than just looking at a summary statistic, because it would be very tempting to just take a mean of this, right? To take an average and say, what's the average response? But look at something like um, smart class parameters compared to the unattended setting in the settings file. Now, these have virtually the same values, look. They start and end in almost exactly the same place. If you took a mean of these things, they come out almost exactly the same. But look at the width of the gray bar, right? Um, Unattended is not a particularly controversial feature. It's mostly apathy. It's mostly people don't care one way or the other what you do with that, right? with a few people that really want to see it go and a few people really want to keep it. Smart class parameters is a different story. It's a much more hotly debated topic, much more people having a, a, an opinion on it. It's you know It was around a long time. It was used a lot in people's puppet code. It is potentially possible people are still using it, um, even though you know we've had a better solution to that for a long time. And so this is where summary graphs like this do a really good job of showing you a better picture of what's going on, right? So I, I, just from a purely like abstract kind of how do we do surveys, I really like that kind of view of these types of questions. Um, so nuance, mostly I think not surprising results, um, mostly already happened. I think, I believe Rackspace has already been taken out, Tom was saying, um, but that's where we're at. So 
The last area I want to talk, talk about before I sort of start to tie all these disparate things together is um, we ask a bunch of questions about development um, and about contribution. And this is the first one. We just ask whether people contribute back. And we always split it into three categories. We say, do, no, I don't, uh, yes, I do, or I'd like to, but I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, and what I find interesting is this, that yes is absolutely pretty much exactly the same, like you know, 0.3% different. Um, but these two see a big, you know, no and, and like to have a big swap over. This is an encouraging graph, right? No has dropped, like to has increased. Um, that would suggest that we might have some more work to do around, I don't know, some kind of ramping on type uh, work to get people where they need to be to contribute. Um, but but that's nice. The, there is a problem with this graph, however, that's not immediately apparent. And the problem is this. I think it's a lie. <laughs> um, and, and I don't mean our community is deliberately lying to us. Um, there's, a, there's a known set of biases within uh, within survey work. Um, and people generally don't want to tell you something they think you don't want to hear, right? Um, if you straight up say to someone, do you like our product? They're not very likely to go, no, it's terrible. Uh, so um, the way you get at this is you ask a slightly more detailed question, right? And we do. We ask, where would you like to contribute? What areas of the of the project would you be interested in contributing to? And as we're going to have a talk on later, it's more than just code, right? So you've got bug reporting. You've got the installer, which is written in Puppet. You've got, you know, do you want to maintain a plugin? That's nothing to do with the core code base, right? Um, do you want to do translations? All of these different areas you could ask about. Now, admittedly, we don't have any data for community work or JavaScript because we didn't ask that last year. But in all the other categories, Every single one of these no's is higher. In some cases, notably so. That's up 10% on the installer, which I don't blame anybody for. Um, and the people who maintain it are heroes. Um, but, you know, okay, all right. Okay, release candidates is down by 2%. I'll give you that one. But still, mostly, these have all gone up. And it's not really, not really compatible for all of the no's to go up on this page, but for it to come down on this page. Uh, it, it doesn't really work, right? Um, and so I, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe the more detailed question than I am to, to believe a sort of very generic question like this one. So this gives me some pause for thought. And then I stopped and I thought, well, um, maybe that's not such a big deal, right? I mean, percentages can drop just by growing the user base. If you have 100 people who use the project and 20 people who contribute, and that's 20%, right? And if you double it to 200 people next year, but only 10 more people contribute, now, well, now you've only got 15%. That's still 30 people on an absolute value, but it's only 15% of the community, right? So has the community grown? Because if the community has grown, then we don't have a problem here because these percentages are quite small. So maybe it's not such a big deal. Um, and so I went and had a look at it. Um, and these, th there's a number of ways you could define community, right? And, and you can go from the smallest, what I would expect to be the smallest community, which is the people who are actually contributing to the code base, uh, and then scale it up to say the people who are reporting bugs on Redmine, uh, scale it up again to say the people who are talking on the forum, um, and then further to say who's just using the software. Now that last one is hard. Um, we're not a sort of proprietary software. We can't just go and look at the number of license keys. Um, but we do have some ways. And, and the most common way we do this is there's an RSS feed. Um, and the default installation of, for, of Foreman does fetch the RSS feed. Um, so we can get an idea of how many people are using it from the Apache logs. Uh, and so I did that. And I plotted them. And this is the result. Now, uh, if we were all in the room together, I would do a, uh, I would do a, or do I want to show of hands as to, as to ask you which ones of these look like they're significant, right? Which ones do you think have a positive slope? Um, because, uh, because well, okay, I think everyone would get that RS, the RSS line has a pretty positive slope, right? I mean, that, that, that looks good. Um, do any of the others? Well, the answer is um, a little bit. Um, but you can see the shaded area is like the confidence interval. And actually, if you statistically ask, can I be sure that this is not just noise? Is it actually flat? And the answer is only the RSS one is definitely not noise. The others might well be flat. So what we're seeing is exactly what I just outlined, basically. Um, there's growth in the community, number of users, less growth in the sort of development side of things, people reporting bugs, people um, you know, contributing on Git and so on. And when I say Git, to be clear, that's everything in the Foreman org and the Catello org. It's about 200 repos. Um, so OK, let's just tie that up. So the community is growing. Development community less so. Not necessarily bad, right? We have a thing, um, most projects and software things and companies, and you know, this is a well a well studied thing called growth maturity decline. Don't worry about the decline bit. I'm not saying that. That's doom and gloom. We're not talking about that. But we're 11 years old. We're definitely in the maturity bit. And so I would expect to see the user base continuing to grow, but perhaps the development not growing quite so fast. That's that's you know expected of a mature project, and that's not terrible, right? That's actually fine. 
Um, but it does explain most of the results in the survey, which is nice. Um, and so that puts us firmly in our in our maturity section, which is fantastic. Um, uh, I will say one thing uh, that fits into that idea of maturity, which is we also ask a question about how long people have been in the community. Um, and again, you can see the same kind of pattern. We've got a big growth in the people who've been here a long time, less growth in the, in the new people. These are not zero, right? This is not decline. This is not nobody's taking our project on. Um, these are these are fine, but they are smaller. So we're definitely in that maturity stage. People liking us, less people coming on board than in previous years expected. That's fine, um, but doesn't mean terrible. And certainly doesn't mean there's nothing we can do about it. Um, it just it's good to know where we are on that curve, right? And that's that's where we are. We're up here. So why are we here? I think is the next question. I want to, I, I promised I'd tie back to all that talk about provisioning and why I thought that was interesting. Um, and, and here's my theory, right? And you can debate this afterwards. As I said, I'm actually on holiday, so I'm going to disappear as soon as my talk is done. Um, but you can talk about this amongst yourselves and see whether you think I'm right. Um, we are in a world which is largely dominated by containers now. And, and, it, and that was why it surprised me initially that we didn't see a drop in the use of provisioning. But I think it's because Foreman's found its niche, right? There's always going to be a use for people uh, to, that, that we will have a use for people who, ha who have hardware to look after. And I think that broadly falls into a number of categories, such as people with on-premise stuff to deal with, you know, if you're running like a set of shops with with point of sale stuff, or if you're running um, just like an office, right? You've just got a lot, a lot of desktops to look after. And if you're a small or even a medium enterprise that's just got a lot of that kind of thing going on, I have a friend who works in an abattoir who has to go and deal with like all the machines actually down on the factory floor, right? I mean, that's not container work and never will be. Um, and so that's one end. And at the very far other end, you've got the huge people who actually do have a lot of work done in containers, um, but they've got their own private, and infrastructure, right? And you can manage the undercloud with form and all, the, some, all those containers have to run on something. Um, and so I think we found our niche is like a really, really good hardware management platform. Um, if you're doing containers properly, if you're in that middle, if you've got like a, a platform that you're shipping out on the internet doing as a service stuff, then yeah, why would why would you use us? That's not going to work, right? And I mean, we've tried doing containers in the past and it, it didn't go so well. Um, so I feel like that's where we've fallen, and I think that that was that was what clicked it for me. If I go right back here, is there's not really much talk of any kind of container things going on here. There's some discovery stuff, but that's still really bare metal handling. Um, you know, the, sort of the cloud in it stuff is pretty small, um, and that's only one way of doing containers, right? So, I, like, there's there's nobody trying to do containers with us anymore, as far as I can tell. Um, and so that kind of cemented that view for me. Is that okay? We know what our position is. We know what we're good at, and we're doing it really, really well. You know, our quality is very high. People like what we're doing, and they're do and they're using it for the thing that's intended for. Great. Um, so that's why I think we see we see the, the that's what explains a lot of the results. I think so. Yes, provisioning starts to fall down this naturally opinionated line. We've got maturity in various areas of the project, um, but we're still seeing growth because people still do have that use case and still want to to use it and want to solve it, and we're still solving it. So that's great. Um, so, yeah, um, these are all the things I've just said, basically. Um, no, 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 containers in the middle ground, yes, image-based stuff, those, yeah, local things. Yeah, that's everything I just said. Good, didn't miss anything. Uh, I think I'm almost out of time. We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, so that's me. Uh, there's a lot more in the survey. I know Tom is going to cover some of it for you. Um, there's a lot more we can do in terms of subsetting questions. Again, Tom is going to show you some of those answers. That's where we take one question and look at it through the lens of another. So it might be interesting. For example, one question we didn't have time to go into is uh, if you take, say, this graph and you ask the question, is there a difference in that between new people to the project versus the people that have been using Foreman for four years? Um, how does that graph look if you split it in two? That's a perfectly valid question, right? And you could do that for any pair of questions. And that's like, you know, 55 squared number of possible combinations, and I don't have time for that, right? So um, if people want to do that, I'm happy to do those as people request them. I'm not going to sit there and do all possible pairs. Uh, so yeah, if you've got interesting questions, do hit me up. Um, you can get me in these places. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to hang around for the next sort of five minutes while I finish my cup of tea. Uh, so if anyone's got any sort of spoken questions, hit me up. Otherwise, you can find me in IOC. I'll be back at my desk on Thursday morning where I'll pick up my messages. Uh, and we can have a chat. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, are there any questions? So I have one question. Will you continue to do the survey and to do 
to present the survey results next year? <laughs> Um, I'd like to. I mean, it's it, so. So I mean, we don't talk too much about internals, right? But within Red Hat, Foreman still falls under my remit uh, for the work that I do. Um, there are other things that take up a lot of my time, but I will make space for Foreman where I can. It's still very dear to me. Uh, so yes, I'll be quite happy to continue to help out where I can. And that's not just the survey, to be clear. If people have other questions in you, know, you don't have to come to me once a year, right? <laughs> if there are if there are interesting statistical questions that we want to answer, then by all means, reach out to me. Okay, cool. Another question? I just, uh, I don't even know, is it a, a question that Greg can answer, but at the moment, I, myself and Elzap, you know, Lukas Zapletal, if that is how you pronounce his name, the two of us are drawing up a series of, uh, I suppose, deep dives into provisioning called Provisioning with Elzap that will, you know, will run live. And I was just wondering, Greg, is there, from the survey, is there anywhere that you think that we should be focusing to maybe bring people along on places where they're? Hmm. That's a tricky one. I think I think people consume content in different ways, um, and they're, all, they're you know I think I think any content is better than no content, right? So so in some senses, yes, do it clearly. Um, We've talked a bit about this, I know, and um, from what you said to me, I think it's a great idea. I don't think there's any specific topic that's obvious to tackle. I think it's all useful. I do think um, it depends on your goal, uh, but from one thing I always wanted to do when I was a community manager I never found time for was like a set of like how-to videos like that build up over time. So um, it was it was a big thing. I don't know. There's a lot of people out there who hate videos and just want to read something, and I get that. Um, I'm kind of like that because you can't cut and paste commands from a video, right? Um, so that's annoying. Uh, but but I kind of had this idea of doing these sort of 15 minute videos, and then you do like a transcript underneath so people could cut and paste from it. And um, and then and that's the sort of thing you can watch in your lunch break if you're just trying to get form and set up on the side for whatever work you're doing, right? Um, and that that was kind of something I was thinking about. Um, so I, I I think that would be amazing, clearly, because that was my idea. Um, but. Uh, so to answer your question, can we see in the data that we have if there's a specific preference for a particular platform to show? Um, the answer is a bit. <laughs> um, I've got like two minutes left. Let's see if I can just very quickly uh, go to this page here. So what I'm going to share now is the graphs that I've shared with Toma and Ori and Mel. Um, which are like the raw, um, the raw data, right? So I'm carefully going to not show the URL because this is a bit kind of um, un there's a lot of comments in here from me to them. <laughs> it's like careful with that. Um, there's nothing here. There's, I'm not swearing or anything clearly, but you know it needs cleaning up before it's properly published as a blog post. Anyway, point is, um, we do have somewhere in here. Uh, it's, there's many many compute resources. No, that's that's contributing. I'm sure we have one in here that shows, here it is, where do people provision? So there's, here's a graph here. Um, so you can see that VMware's, basically bare metal, VMware, LibVirt, EC2, are, are your, uh, that's that's your top ones, and maybe over, over it's actually ahead of EC2. This is ordered by 2019 for some reason. Um, so those are your top ones there. Um, so if you're gonna pick what you're gonna show off, um, those are gonna be the ones to do. Um, that said, Foreman's, uh, Foreman's existence is to make things easy, right? It's to make things look the same. Um, that's kind of one of the things we do well. And so um, is there gonna be a great deal of content in going, right, here's Foreman for VMware, right now, here's Foreman for EC2. It's kind of the same, just these fields are different. It's like, you're better off showing people how to do provisioning first and then maybe go through just what are the differences from. Anyway, long answer, I hope that helped. <laughs> That's great, Greg. Thank you. I think there was, was there a question from? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to ask if provisioning is so popular, does it make sense uh, to review what would make, uh, you know, what feature, maybe non trivial or not small that happened naturally, uh, make sense to invest in? So, I mean, I'm surprised that that every, you know, based on your statistics, every second user of Foreman actually using TFTP kind of a PXC based provisioning. Can we make their life easier? So, you know, we talked in the, over the years about a lot of awesome stuff we can do, but, you know, never got to it. Just wondering if that's something we should 
you know consider doing or want to do so i think so I th so hi xbox i haven't spoken in a while <laughs> um i think the reason tftp is always highest is the only one that's enabled by default right so you have to take that into account there's bias there um, and it's difficult to account for that bias. I don't know what the true value of TFTP would be if we didn't do that, right? Um, that said, it's the only the reason it's enabled is it's the only one that's non intrusive, right? And that's why we do it. Um, so, can we make our life easier? I feel that feels like a new question, right? I don't think we can answer that from the data that we have, because um, I don't know what's making their life hard or, or why they don't enable the other things, right? That we already do. Um, so, yeah. I, I mean, there's always scope for there's always scope for more questions. Um, does it make sense to do it? That's not my job anymore. <laughs> I, um, I think I, uh, one thing we've discussed uh, over a year now ago um, is to perhaps merge discovery into um, form core, make that walk out of the box, possibly with uh, fewer possible combinations on uh, some more happy paths. But um, do we? I don't think we have Lukash on the call, I think he's on holidays, but um, yeah, that's something that's definitely uh, like a... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, discovery, you know, I, I'm not going to share screen a third time, but it's 20%, right? 20% of the survey results. And, and just to be clear to people, these results are weighted, right? So I attempt to account for uh, some bias there because we know that people on latest versions or who are very active in the project are more likely to fill it in. So we do some weighting there to try and get a better representation of the whole community. Uh, and so our best guess is that something like 20% of the community are using discovery. And that's pretty significant, right? Um, that probably um, makes it worth investigating, doing, doing, making that easier to set up, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not trivial. This could lead to a discussion. If you force, force in quotes, discovery into the provisioning flow, you could, you know, where machine boots into discovery first, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, just because it's the default discovery mechanism or whether you actually go for a step, then you can use discovery as a tool to do standardized hardware related mm -hmm. effort. You just mentioned that Foreman is a hardware. Um, That's how I've always tool. seen it anyway. <laughs> and and I, it kind of it took me by surprise because, you know, I always try to stay away or agnostic. Well, I, think to the it is. I think it is. I mean, yes, there's the configuration management there, but if you're doing, if you're doing your hardware right, you don't need the configuration management either, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. my, my, now, was, nowadays, that's true. I mean, no, that wasn't I, true five years ago, right? But I, I was referring to, you know, we don't care about which hardware we run on. We don't care about, you know, it's a well, to a point. It has to pixie. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking, for example, today things like firmware becomes important. You know, there's security mm. vulnerabilities. There's things that people need to right. deal with. So right. I was like, I was just responding to Tomer's suggestion about if we put discovery in core, you could have Discovery yes. as a tool. We've, we've talked about that. Yeah. yeah and we, I know. Yeah. But I mean, nothing, nothing here is new, right? We, uh, but still, you know, you could build a, instead of building a solution for Debian and building a solution for CentOS, mm. but, you know, you could go for discovery and upgrade firmwares and have like a firmware library mm -hmm. uh, that you could do stuff. Uh, you know, all kinds of things that helps customers to solve. Yeah, I'd love to say that. I think that would be great because we, we talked about that, I don't know how many years ago, um, and and we never quite got around to it. Um, but I would have loved to have seen Discovery used for, yeah, an intermediate platform. Um, I can't remember when that was. I forget which which random foster that was where we talked about stuff, as we did every year. And um, and and I thought it was a brilliant idea because at the time, you know, I could still remember a time when I had to deal with that stuff. And now I can't anymore because it's like a decade ago. <laughs> um, so you know, it's I, I do I do think that has a lot of potential, and it's more than just that. Cause it's like setting up things like your RAID as well. Like, you know, it's like there's a lot of like pre-deployment tasks, right? And that could that could encompass a lot of things that you could manage um, through discovery as a platform for sure. Anyway, look, I do have to dash um, before my wife kills me because, as I say, I'm supposed to be on holiday today. Uh, so um, I will see you all later. Uh, but do uh, do fire questions at me uh, by email or, or wherever and with you when I get back. Have a good party, everyone, and I'll uh, see you when I see you. Thank you, Greg.